Hey guys, a couple weeks ago, you might have remembered that, uh, there I am, we, uh, me and my friend Mark, we're doing a little conversation on the intersection of business and faith. I don't, did we get cut short or, I don't know what happened, but we didn't quite finish everything. And Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, yeah, so I, uh, I think, I, I think what we'll probably have to do is sort of update the file, right? We have to sort of like kind of recapitulate some of the major things that we accomplished in that last one. I don't know if we need to dwell mm -hmm. on it for too long, but the big thing that I wanted to explore today with you is something that came up in that conversation is this distinction between uh, religious objections, religious consciousness, and those who may not have any sort of faith commitments, but may be, I guess, conscientious uh, objectors or so something, something of that Mm -hmm. that, something of that. So how do we, how do we make that distinction? How it's seen in the eyes of the law? Is is that the right expression? Conscientious objector. Well, yeah, it's as good as a, it's as good of a, uh, of a uh, you know phrase as any. The the particular phrase that um, I was thinking of, which which um, has arisen and has been used in a couple of the laws that we talked about last time in Mississippi and in Georgia, even though the Georgia one was ultimately vetoed. Was, was um, uh, was moral conviction, um, but I think the the essence is is essentially the same, and, and the the laws both used the the phrasing um, religious religious belief or moral conviction, um, and we can sort of flesh out a little bit why you know that. But it, it did seem that um, in those in those two laws, you could they they can be different things, and you could base your actions on one or the other, and still get, uh, receive the protection of that particular. So yeah, let's maybe we should develop the tension between these two a little bit more. So like, let's can can you sort of give a concrete example of how someone may sort of express their religious objection versus mm -hmm. someone who may express a moral concern, like a moral objection. Like, um, if there's a similar sort of scenario, I think we were using the example of bakeries, right? Well, could you, yeah, could yeah, you I do mean, it in that of, scenario? Yeah. So the way that a lot of this has arisen. Um, we talked about bakery over here called Ashes Bakery in Northern Ireland. Um, now, there's uh, the, the, again, just to recap very briefly, their their issue was somebody had requested a cake with a pro-gay marriage message on it. They uh, were quite open. The bakery that is were quite open that they ran their business on Christian principles, and they, they objected to being forced to write or being requested to write this on a cake. Um, and so they, uh, they refused and ultimately were, were found sort of dis discriminated. Um, now they were, they were obviously clear that um, from their perspective, it was a matter of religious belief in that marriage was solely between one man and one woman. Um, but you know, as most people are sort of aware in general, there have been, there has been in the last sort of 10 years, both in Europe and in, in various other countries of the world and very, and very much so in the United States, a, a big swing uh, in favour legally of um, uh, of same sex mar same sex marriage to the point where the Supreme Court held last year that a state could not deny somebody the right uh, to could not deny a same sex couples the right to marry. Um, largely in response to that, there have been a number of individual actions. The, the more famous one being. Um, that uh, woman, Kim Davis, who was in Kentucky or West Virginia, I forget exactly where she was, um, who said that forcing her to issue marriage licenses to uh, gay couples was a was uh, essentially a, a you know was was violating her religious freedom, was forcing her to do something that she disagreed with, um, and kind of following on from that, there have been a number of cases. There have been a couple of cases. One, uh, or laws, I should say, rather rather not cases. Uh, one in Georgia and one in Mississippi, which seek to, uh, which claim at least they seek to protect people exercising this religious faith um, and and, pr and pr protect them from being uh, prosecuted or you know suffering any kind of penalty if they say, look, I don't I don't agree with same sex marriage and I'm not going to participate in it. Um, so the one in Georgia was vetoed by the governor, largely, I think, in response to a significant amount of negative publicity that arose when it was publicized. And a very similar one, almost word for word, uh, was passed in Mississippi, 
uh, just, I think, in the last couple of weeks. Um, the interesting thing I found about both of these was that both laws protected people who who um, argued, and I have a, the, the, the snippet of the uh, Mississippi one right here, it essentially says that if somebody... Uh, uh, if somebody holds us a, uh, a sincerely held religious belief or moral conviction that marriage is sh or should be between a man and a woman, that sexual relations are properly reserved to that marriage, or that um, essentially male and female are immutable characteristics, um, then if somebody acts in accordance with those with those beliefs, then they're then they're not subject to penalties in a variety of different way in a variety of different activities such as refusing to participate in a, a wedding uh, for, for same-sex couples. So the fact that the, that the laws both use this phrase, sincerely held religious belief or moral conviction, mm -hmm. I thought was a very interesting distinction. Obviously, it's using the disjunctive or, or. So it would seem that you could, based on this, have no particular matter of faith, no particular religious objection to same-sex marriage, but you could just say, I don't think dudes should be able to get married. I don't like it. That's my moral conviction, and I'm not participating. And, it's, and, and that, to me, seems to take this protection, whether you agree that it should be in place for religious faith at all, it seems to take it significantly further. Um, so, so that's kind of the context in where this distinction has arisen as a legal matter. It is an interesting distinction, and I think probably worth exploring is trying to understand the difference between a moral conviction and a religious conviction. Right. So, so I try to get my head inside of <clears throat> uh, the dude who's like, I, I, I don't like that. It's not natural. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't believe in God or I don't know if there's a God or I don't believe in any particular holy book or something like that, but I do believe in nature and mm -hmm. it, it's just unnatural. It makes me feel icky and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that the same as the person who's like, no, my, I, it's, it's nothing personal. My, my religion just commands me yeah. not to do this. Um, it seems like they're qualitatively different on some level. Uh, like the per person who's sincerely holding it and the person who's just like, oh man, that, that sort of icks me out. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I, I think, the, I think the question is, is like, I, I don't know, at least in this particular issue, I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me, and maybe I mean, it's hard for me because I, I don't feel strongly uh, uh, <laughs> on this issue. It's hard for me to see that anyone who would just have the moral conviction would be really, really animated by it, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I, I could see maybe someone who's got the religious conviction maybe having like some sort of passion to him, but the person who just has the moral conviction, it seems like they're just it's just a, a grody feeling. It's mm -hmm. a nebulous sort of grody feeling. Do you think you can have a passionate moral feeling, or is it just kind of like a prejudice? Is that what we just call prejudice? Well, see, in, I, I mean, in that I think scenario, that's... it seems just like prejudice. But I can think of other scenarios where a moral con people, because obviously people who do have moral convictions yet don't believe in God, mm -hmm. um, can have very passionate moral convic convictions, right? Like. Um, it's just well, the one I was, the one I was thinking yeah. of was, you know, there are plenty of, uh, uh, I mean, there are people, particularly you would think of the Quakers, who as part of, as a, a, you know, a fundamental element of their faith are uh, pacifists and, and will generally, uh, you know, refrain from any kind of, uh, you know, refrain from participating in war, um, will will be conscientious objectors. Um but well, you I know, think there are there, but but there are plenty of people. I think certainly on on the left of the political spectrum who would consider themselves, you know, both atheist or agnostic, and also pacifist, and would would feel that conviction there, you know, equally strongly. Yeah, or, or at I, least I would. I would say equally strongly. Yeah, you, you, you don't know, but yeah, if I were to schematize the. If I were to sort of schematize these four episodes, you've got the sort of person who feels passionately about. Um, uh, the, it being irreligious reform, um, anything relating to homosexual marriage. And then individuals who are Quaker and object to war, 
and then mm -hmm. individuals who are secular in objective war, those seem closer together. May we, but we may be uncomfortable with that. That doesn't mean just because they have passion doesn't mean that their viewpoint is correct. But there seems to be something more passionate about what they are talking about than say the individual who just thinks that homosexual marriage is grody and they have sort of no real faith commitments or something, mm -hmm. something like that. So um, it's not going to be the the presence of passion or not and the ethical commitment that is going to um, determine whether the, the sincerity of the belief. Like, oh, 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 okay, I'm trying to say here, let me see if I can back this up. I, I'm super tired. Is that, um, I guess I was just saying whether or not one believes in God doesn't, doesn't really affect the passion for which we have our ethical commitments. In fact, mm -hmm. I think you could even have a scenario where you do very piously believe in God, but have very, have a very blase attitude towards ethical commitments entirely. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you sort of, sort of, you, you, you may believe passionately in God, but you're totally resigned in this world. Like you could really uh, care less what happens. Like you could, mm -hmm. you, you're, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's more of a Buddhistic kind of um, perspective or if that's like kind of what Kierkegaard would call the night of infinite resignation or I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe some sort of Socratic view where you're kind of just checked out and living in like some yeah. uh, platonic realm. I, I, I don't know exactly, but it seems like we're having all these different sorts of things, but it, it, it does seem like the, that there are, it's very possible for people of faith and not of faith to have similar sorts of intensity of feelings. But so the question, I, I guess the question is, does, does the presence of the faith commitment affect the ethical passion for which we feel? Like, it, like, so like, so like the Quaker, mm -hmm. right? The Quaker conscientious objector, objector, and the pacifist secularist, like, if we were to try to get inside their minds, and I know this experiment is like really impossible, at least because because neither one of us is a Quaker can really get inside of that. But right, I don't know. Um, what role does God play in that ethical passion? Does it is God's role in the ethical passion insignificant and really? the place of that ethical passion comes more from just pure conscience. Maybe the Quaker just misattributes it to God if they, if they attribute it to God at all. I'm not, I'm not, mm -hmm. not, I'm not schooled in Quaker theology. So what do you think about that? I mean, you know, I think that's, I mean, part of the, part of the problem is, is sort of making that connection between, in, um, you know, between the ultimate action or the, or the, or the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the ultimate belief of the individual and, Tracing it back to this individual source of uh, uh, of of God, right? Because there are plenty of people who have equally fervent belief in God, in the Christian God, but are not but are not pacifists. And you know, I mean, you, uh, I mean, God and guns, you know, to put it very simply, are in the in certainly in the current sort of Republican, conservative American uh, American conservative, you know theology so to speak is uh you know they go together you know you 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 love your guns you love your country you love god you know i mean and and there are plenty of people who consider themselves very strongly people of faith and support a strong military and 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 service in the military and and the active use of the military in 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 armed conflicts so so to sort of take so to me i mean the Part of the, di the difficulty of the question that you ask is that um, is you know do, if one it's clearly not the case that if one believes in God one has to be a pacifist. So if one believes in God and is also a pacifist because one is a Quaker, does that is, is that evidence of more passion or less passion uh, of of just taking a particular that that just happens to be their approach. And if if that's the case, then what's does it is it worthy of is it worthy of, of more recognition from society at large? I think it's a I think it's a proper distinction, and I, I you know in all these pot all these podcasts, I sort of you know I, I weave Kierkegaard into it because that's a lot of my 
point of departure. Mm-hmm. But I, I think he was really concerned that if you have such passions for things outside of Christianity, um, whether they be ethical commitments or a thirst for intellectual truth or aesthetic delights, is that it sort of dilutes the passion that we have for God. And I liked how you talked about how this, we have this sort of nexus of American theology of God and guns and flags and things like that. And I think the concern, if Kierkegaard were in this context, I think he might be sort of concerned that if we're saying that religious ethical passion is, is equal or is like interpenetrated with that sort of American theology, that really the passion for God is quite minimal. The passion is more for nationalistic sort of mm-hmm. celebration and not so much God. There's a too much intensity placed on things of this world and not of the ultimate maker of the world. So I, I guess what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying is that I'd be willing to wager that if there is a difference between religious and secular passion in regards to ethical commitments, I would say that, um, the Quakers may have a, 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 a finer, more refined, more purified form of religious passion than, say, your your flag waving uh, nationalist. Mm-hmm. Um, then the question sort of becomes: How is that? Because, and the reason why I say this is because the Quaker shows detachment from the world of things. The Quaker has properly prioritized God. The, mm-hmm. the Quaker hasn't equated God with country and flag and guns or whatever else. The Quaker has understood the proper place of those things. So then the question becomes, what's the qualitative difference? If I can, I mean, would you say that that stands? I mean, I, 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 cause I mean, yeah, as a sort of lefty pacifist type that, that certainly that resonates well with me. And, you know, that would, you know, that would be, you know, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and frankly, you know, and, and without going off on too much of a tangent, I've always, Found the the sort of you know strongly uh, nationalistic and you know uh, Christian you know, this this idea of strong uh, of you know strongly nationalistic Christianity or conservative Christianity to to me to be very to to be uh, problematic on a lot of levels. So yeah, I mean in general, I think I would I would agree with your with your analysis there. So then the question becomes: Is there a, a significant difference between the person of, of secular moral conscience and the, and, and the Quaker, mm-hmm. um, the, you know, so the Quaker, so what are the differences? The Quaker believes he has rightly prioritized God above all things. And the secular person is not acknowledging God, mm-hmm. but maybe you can speak more to this. And this is a very strange question. Yeah. And some people say this, um, I think there are a lot of people that believe that individuals of good conscience are closer to God and the feeling of the divine than individuals who are constantly beating a Bible, constantly mm-hmm. trying to drill something into people's heads, who are very, I guess, maybe the word is pharisaical. Is that, is that the word? Like, like the Pharisees that mm-hmm. want everybody to think that they're very religious, but actually don't have the intensity mm-hmm. of commitment. What do you think about that as a secular person? If I were to say to you, you know, Mark, you and I aren't so different after all. It's just what you call conscience, I call God. What, what would you say if I said that to you? Because I am saying it to you right now. <laughs> um, you know, uh, does that make you I mean, feel weird? I've never thought about it in in, the, in terms of the of the divine. You know, I would never say that you know, a secular humanist who just believes that you know there are certain things as human rights and um, and that you know we should respect all people and so on. Necess- I would never I, I, I would never describe that person as as closer to divinity. Um, large, although having said that, I've never really spent a, any amount of time considering what what you know what divinity really would mean in, you know, in, in, in any kind of context. But, um, it's worth know, I mean, the, right? pro- the problem, the problem, the, pro- the problem that I've always, the, pro- the problem I always, I, I come up against it all, all the time is, you know, if, if we're, if we're, a lot of it is almost, it's almost like kind of saying, okay, there are, 
decisions and there are things that we do as human beings and we make up rules and we and we sometimes we break them and, and we say well this is a better way of doing it or that's not and a lot of those rules are laws some of them are constitutions which are you know have an even sort of higher hierarchy or, um, but you know to to the extent that we're looking for rules or general you know general rules general laws that transcend all of that that transcend all of human experience things that we would typically say look look at as moral convictions as saying you know no matter even if 99.9% of the people think this is the right thing to do it's nonetheless morally wrong you know that are absent that are separate from majoritarianism you know if you know you can you can you can pursue you can pursue sort of general rules and you know the sort of legal background is all about making rules right so you can say well you know torture is wrong you can just say flatly torture is wrong and you could say that it would be antithetical to christian ideals and you could i'm sure you could find a passage in the bible that would support that but if you're not looking at that as the source of authority for that statement you know you have to look for something that's almost kind of you know antecedent to human existence and say okay where's the source of the authority because if, if it's just the majority saying torture is wrong then the majority can just change their mind and say you know what torture is actually okay in some circumstances and the the problem in, in all of these things is um is is locate locating the source of that authority and that's that's one of the problems that i've always always found when you you know if you're not looking if there isn't some external or antecedent source of what's right and wrong it's difficult to identify um so all of which is to say that my feeling on this is a lot of it is is that in in most cases it is a matter of pragmatism you know it's a matter of us just saying look we all agree that torture is wrong and you know we just have to that's the best that we can do so i wouldn't have, i wouldn't categorize that as divinity um, or, you know, and on the same for pacifism or, you know, uh, opposition to slavery or any of these things, I wouldn't categorize these, these things as divinity. I would just categorize them as, as just like the best rules that we can come up with. Yeah. But I mean, I guess the thing is, right. Like if they're, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that, I mean, I'm not trying to make the case that God is sort of identical with one's moral consciousness. Maybe what I, I, I probably am trying to advance the smaller claim that because we view something as sort of inviolable about moral conscience, mm -hmm. um, that there may be something um, noble, dignified, um, perhaps autonomous. I, I, some, there, there might be some element within us that is some sort of emanation of the divine and i i mean is that a let is that a less unsettling view of it for you than the idea that it's just like sort of these constructs that we can sort of like play jazz with that we can constantly sort of abridge um whenever we see fit i don't know i mean both both views have really significant existential trade-offs right because if you take the view that there is some sort of spark of something non-natural within mm -hmm. us, this sort of inviolable source of moral volition, um, right? That that would require believing in something miraculous, right? But uh, on the other I hand, mean, so, yeah, I mean, on so, the other I hand, mean, miraculous is an odd word. That I, well, maybe not. It's not the word I would use, but um, it's certainly requires believing in something that doesn't follow the laws of physics as we know them. Right. I'll tell you what, man. I beat the laws of physics last night. Oh, yeah? I slept. I've slept. <laughs> I told you this earlier. I've slept seven hours out of the last 48 hours. Um, every, every cell in my body wants to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yet there's something else within me that is totally uninterested in that. And I don't know, I guess what I'm saying, there's another part in me um, 
that is completely resistant to pure biological processes. Because yes. otherwise, otherwise, I would have slept like a clod of earth last night. And well, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is, I I don't know. I I mean, I was laying awake at like five in the morning, and I was just like, yeah, my my mind is separate from my body. It really has to be. There's no other explanation for this. Because like, well, <laughs> well, that's funny because that's what exactly what I was about to say. It was like, surely your mind is a biological process, but uh, um, you know, and that you know, then you, then you, then you know, we could do. A, I'm sure this is a whole separate thing that philosophers have looked at. You know that we're you know what is the, you know, what is the mind and all of that, but uh, that's probably out of, out of the reach of this particular, um, uh, this particular discussion. So let me ask you then if, so if we bring, so bringing it back again, you know, I guess to bring it back to the, the laws that are now, the law that is now on the books in Mississippi, we, I don't think we haven't quite got to the point. Do we think that, that, this religious belief or this moral conviction should be given the same recognition by society. You know, it seems like it's going to be sort of case by case analysis because there are, but then that's so hard because then you sort of like, if you start, if you, if you overreach or, you know, you kind of become sort of, um, totalitarian in nature I mean, there's a, there's a wide gulf between the mo the secular moralist objection to war and mm -hmm. the 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 bro who just finds like homosexual union to be unnatural. Um, I mean, I I guess the thing is because we have established that you can't have significant moral passion even if you are secular that from a governmental perspective and a, and a legalistic perspective, even though we may not like it because it would uh, allow people to get away with uh, moral objections arbitrarily, we have to err on the side of those who have considerable passion for the conscientious objections. But I guess there's a more, in, I, so I guess they would, you know, the, the people, so does that make sense? Like from a legalistic perspective, I guess I'm okay, I'm okay with the moral conviction, even if there's some mm -hmm. individuals who are, when they're expressing that moral conviction, are really just expre expressing bigotry or, 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 or prejudice. Because I mean, you know, I don't, I, uh, I don't like thing, it. I, I mean, don't like in some it. ways, these are all on a spectrum, aren't they? You know, like yeah. the, or on a continuum, I should say. I suppose, but um, what? Well, at least I would say that they're on a continuum. You know, maybe somebody would disagree, would, would, would argue that, you know, once something takes on a religious or a faith-based, you know, conviction, it moves off that continuum, you know, or, or, or is it just that, you know, you have general beliefs, you know, I mean, I think, you, you know, you, you sort of highlighted before how, you know, a moral conviction, you know, can just be another name for somebody's prejudice or bigotry. So... You know, if you're saying, "Well, we're going to err on the side of, of, of recognizing those," which again is is permitting people to discriminate against others based on that moral conviction. Uh, I mean, in this context, it's solely, and the, the law in Mississippi is solely in the context of um, of sort of, you know of same sex marriage and um, and transgender rights. But if you establish that as a as the basis, why could not somebody say, "You know what, my." religion forbids me for, you know, things it, I shouldn't cater an interracial wedding. You know, I'm not making a case. Well, I think, I, th and I think the context is really important because when I was saying that you might have to grant the, the, the moral convictions of people, I was thinking still more in the context of war, mm -hmm. right? And war seems so much more serious to me than these cake and gay marriage battles. I don't care about this stuff. Like, so I was thinking about the, the, the pacifist, the, our Quaker and our, and mm -hmm. our secular pacifist. Um, so it would, so I guess the, and so the question is, Luke, why do you care about, why are you willing to allow people with moral conviction to be exonerated from like saying serving overseas or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever, but like the other individuals have moral convictions about, um, catering a wedding or something or something like that. And why are you willing to marshal them in one scenario and not in another? So I think that's probably a more interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I mean, you probably feel the same way, right? I mean, I think we're on the same page about that. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, and, and to some extent, you know, a lot of it is the consequences. You know, in in the war, in the, you know, in the, the 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 issue of conscientious objectors, you're asking somebody to, you know, put on armor, pick up a gun, and go and kill other people. Right. That's not- that is, seems to me that is not really comparable with asking somebody to to make a cake or, or arrange some flowers. So is when that- they're in, especially because when they're in business, when they've put themselves out there voluntarily as a business person saying i'm going to you know i'm open for business for people who want to pay for my services is not the same thing as 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 forcing some especially because in these kind of things you know conscientious objection arises in the um context of conscription or in in the context of a draft you know as you call it over there you know it's because if there's no national service or there's no conscription you just don't sign up so So that that's yeah, so it seems like it seems like that the line, at least that we've established so far, is that when it would require taking another life, that that's when the the con- the, the the moral conviction, whether it be religiously mm-hmm. inspired or morally inspired, ought to be respected. So, um, if it, you're going to ask me to kill somebody, if you're going to ask me to perform an abortion, if you're going to ask me to euthanize someone, if you're going to ask me to execute someone, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I, so I could see all of those being legitimate scenarios where we're like, okay, we're not going to punish an individual for saying I have moral or religious conviction for stepping aside from this, but are you comfortable with that limited domain of where we respect re- moral conviction? Cause I think we, a scenario that we talked about in the last time that we did this was, you know, what if, um, you know, what if the the tables were turned and the the Ku Klux Klan walked mm-hmm. into the Christian bakery or to a homosexual bakery and demanded? Um, mm-hmm. to, I mean, see, and, and see, the Ku Klux Klan is universally despised, so we're more willing to allow that those people to refuse those individuals' service, regardless of what their faith commitments are. None of them are, but. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, ought they to be? I, I, I mean, I want to say yes, but I mean, if we're, I mean, we're, so well, what, I mean, it, yeah, what do you think about in the, that? In the U.S., you know, constitutional and legal system as far as free speech and, and so on, um, I mean, one of the biggest sort of no-nos is making anything that looks like a content-based distinction. So, you know, one of the, you know, and, and that's, so, you know, the, the, the clan, as long as they're not, you know, if they're not uh, inciting violence, or um, you know, or, or and, and they're generally respecting, you know, what are called time, place, and manner ah, restrictions. Yes. You know, they they have the right; they can say whatever they want. The content of what they of what they say is is not to be the the matter of distinction. So, you know, so, so you know, the, if they want to have a rally, they can have it, but they're subject to the same rules. But if they were subject to different rules than a than a pro inclusion rally, then that would be content based discri- dis- di- um, discrimination, and that would be prohibited uh, under the U.S. Constitution. So, so we could get away with not making a clan cake because indirectly. If if it if if it were to be a volatile sort of message or something like that, indirectly we might be participating in something that would compromise the lives of others, it, right? I could, no, I mean I, I, I don't think it would go that far. Well, I mean I, the, again, the problem, the thing you have to remember, like the these. I mean, if they've of, got uh, like, if they've got like an effigy or something like that, they want to put on a cake or something like that. That's going to yeah. ultimately encourage people to take, take the lives of someone. I mean, couldn't you say I, that the incitement has to be a lot more? It has to be like immediate kind of incitement, you know. It's uh, you know, and, and, it, and it would be a, it would yeah. be a stretch to say that just having the clan logo is an incitement to kill somebody. You know, I think that would be that. Well, that I wouldn't. Well, I didn't that say that. I used a much more explicit thing of of the of some sort of effigy or something like that. But but yeah, I mean, the, it is an interesting question of like when, and we see this debate going on a lot in the South, right? Like, mm-hmm. what symbols? actually um are manifestations of incitement right yeah so like the big thing in the south right is that people look at the confederate flag way differently 
right? Yeah. There's some individuals who see it as a hate symbol and there are mm-hmm. other individuals who just see it as part of their culture. And I think they legitimately believe that. I don't think it's an excuse because I, I, I've, my views on the Confederate flag changed after spending a good deal of time in the South. Um, mm-hmm. I think, I think one can hold that legitimate position that it's really not supposed to be, um, offensive, but I mean, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a massive, that it, it's a massive, uh, cultural war that's going on. I guess the question is, is anything that the Klan does all autumn? I think it, anything the Klan does seems to be sort of linked to incitement. I mean, don't they, isn't that what it stands for? I, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the, the, is, the, is the clan peaceful nowadays? I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I I wouldn't personally consider them peaceful, but I have I have heard, you know, I've heard interviews with um, with with people, you know, in full clan regalia, mask cover, you know, essentially saying, you know, uh, you know the argument essentially, I've got nothing against black people. They should never have come here from Africa. That was wrong. We just want them to go back there. This should be the white place. That should be the black place. Like that's essentially their argument, rather than advocating actual violence and murder. Um, again, I think it's nonsense, uh, you know, as an argument. But I, I think you would struggle to claim that that was inciting violence. So all of which is to say that um, I don't think that simply requesting something with a clan logo or even with some kind of you know eff- effigy type image on it would. Um, would fall into this exception. The other thing you have to remember, and we're kind of going down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but the the, the restrictions on these are against um, these restrictions prohibit the government from a, a, attaching prior restraint or, or discriminating against people's uh, speech. So the government can't say, "We'll we'll grant you a license to," you know, "We'll grant the the." You know, we're, we're, the, the government can't say, yeah, we'll grant the Black Panthers a right to, to march, but we're not going to grant, grant the Klan a right to march because we don't agree with their message, but we're okay with the Black Panthers' message. Right? So that's the, it's the government that's not allowed to distinguish. Um, on the individual level, certainly in the U.S. I'm trying to think but that's I'm precisely right. what this, this law is allowing individuals to do, right, is to determine who they want to serve and who they don't. But we've... Yes, well, yeah, and this is, where, this is where it does get a little bit sticky because the law is, is essentially saying, hey, you can discriminate or you can not discriminate, but if you do decide to, we're going to, yeah, we're not, gonna, we're not going to prosecute you. And it's a little bit tricky in somewhere like Mississippi because... Um, there aren't exactly a lot of protections for you know. Well, in most, there are no protections in place for um, for homosexuals anyway. Like you, you can you can fire somebody in Mississippi for being gay. There's no legal protection for is that. that. Is that true? Oh um, yeah, really. I mean, and I, I yeah, yeah that's absolutely. That, that's really. Yeah, there's no fed, there's no federal protection for that as well. The, the only protection you would have is if your individual state. Has already has passed a law to protect sexual orientation as a, as a protected class in the workplace. So, where I was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania doesn't have a protect doesn't have that on the books. But the city of Philadelphia itself has passed a law protecting it. So, you know, but obviously their their enforcement rights are somewhat less than the state or the federal level. That's insane, man. Yeah, I, I I just kind of assumed that that was a major no no. <laughs> and all, and all the states. You'd think and all so, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, well. Someone should do something about that. <laughs> we should like maybe uh, through our moral or religious conscience campaign for equality. Yeah. Um. Well, look, man. Um. We're coming up on the forty minute mark. I I don't I don't know if there's like a a nice place to sort of tie a bow on it or whatever. Is is there sort of like a parting question or? Thing. I mean, it sounds like it seems like this particular conversation, unless mm-hmm. uh, is really fertile with discussion, and it looks like we'll just keep going with it. Yeah. Because um, I imagine I'll review this and I'll be like, "Oh man, we didn't. Re- I want to explore this or that or whatever." I mean, so yeah. Why don't you uh, close it out if if you have any sort of parting remarks, mm-hmm. and we'll take up something mm-hmm. next time. Actually, I do because this is 
this is one quote, which is actually one of the sort of fundamental things I was going to think about, or, you know, that I thought we might talk about before we even moved on to the equivalency between religious conviction or moral conviction. Um, we've very much been talking about religion really in the sense and using it using that word as a proxy for christianity mm-hmm. um there are no, you know there are a number of cases well hang on a little bit there are it's there are obviously plenty of other religions and um there are and some of them are organized and have a have a have a well established name like islam or christianity then and there are others which are less so so my question would be is that even if we were to accept that some kind of religious based religious based faith is worthy of some kind of greater protection what counts as religion yeah i see this uh i see this a lot because um there are a lot of people who will not a lot every once in a while someone will go and um make a church or something like yeah. that yeah. Um, because they want to legitimate some practice, right? Like, exactly. Um, precisely. And that's precisely what I'm thinking about. So you poly- know, maybe polygamy is an example solve. of that. Like people, people would like, just like, I want to be able to have five wives. So yeah. I'm just going to come up with a new religion that, that gives me sort of legal exemption. Mm-hmm. Um, or, um, people want to use psychedelics with, yeah. without, yeah. uh, without, um, punishment. And yeah. I'm not saying it's not a legitimate recourse. I'm not saying that they don't have a right to do it. Cause I think what they would say is that they have a religious belief in psychedelics. And so they kind of mm-hmm. get grouped under, uh, clauses that were meant to sort of protect like the, the native Americans and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, Um, yeah, I think that's the thing is, is that if you really, really care to, Mm -hmm. you can create your own religious entity. And we Uh, can talk about, we can sort of think about that, but certainly, (laughs) you know, you know, to, to an extent, if the, if, when, when judges are looking at this and deciding whether or not to, whether, you know, somebody has a religious belief that is being burdened by the state in some way or other. They they'll generally don't delve too deeply into the details of that person's faith, whether this is a necessary part of it, whether uh, whether it's a legit, whether it's traditional church or non traditional or, or whatever. You know, they'll 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 give they'll give significant leeway to the individual to say this is this is my church, this is my church of cannabis, this is my church of body modification, this is my church of psychedelics, whatever, and you know, and that will largely fall within. The protections designed, which clearly I think were designed originally for your more traditional religious observance. So, yeah, well, maybe we can sort of you know, the th- thinking about the thinking about that as as you know what what are the limits? What should constitute a religion? You know what what are we willing to accept and what are we not willing to accept? Yeah. Have you have you seen the the thing that John Oliver did on televangelists? I did, yes. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's pretty interesting because he went through the the, the legal code and mm-hmm. got, and and what did he? What kind of church did he establish? Oh, I can't even remember. But the, he, uh, it was just the like the ch- now, but, church uh, of himself or something like that, and people yeah. were sending him money and all, and all sorts of random things in the mail. It was pretty funny. It was extremely. Um, yeah, I think maybe we'll pick that up next time. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right. All right, man. I'm going to try to get a nap. <laughs> all right thanks mark give in to biology <laughs> yeah i'm gonna try all right bye man see ya